Hello, my name is Nerida Campbell and I'm the Acting Head of Curatorial here at Sydney Living Museums. Welcome to today's Discover SLM talk. And I extend a particularly warm welcome to our supporters, donors and members today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I currently work and live. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we'll be sharing some of our research with you as we explore a range of subjects from food to furnishing textiles, from celebrity marriages to colonial bungalows. Join me every Tuesday at 4 till 4.30 to hear our curators delve into a new topic. Today, I'm going to share with you some of my research into the female felons of the Roaring Twenties here in Sydney. I've worked as a curator for over 20 years, much of that time here at Sydney Living Museums, and I spend most of my time researching the darker and more obscure histories of Sydney and indeed wider New South Wales. I'm a small town girl, I grew up outside of Sydney and I enjoy the stories of our countryside and our regions. My most recent exhibition, along with the publication of the same name, is Underworld, Mugshots of the Roaring Twenties, and it's currently on display at the National Archives of Australia in Canberra. If you have any questions, add them to the chat and I'll endeavour to answer them at the end of the talk. But let's begin. The Justice and Police Museum in Sydney is the custodian of the New South Wales Police Forensic Photography Archive, some of which you see on your screen now, which contains over two and a half thousand images of suspects in police custody during the Roaring Twenties, which have become known as special photographs. These glass plate negatives of the inhabitants of 1920s criminal underworld here in Sydney have been repackaged now in archivally sound paper and scanned and preserved for future generations. All of the images that I'll be showing you today are from this collection unless otherwise identified. Here are some of them in their original boxes and in their repackaged boxes. They are an incredibly valuable source of information about female criminals whose stories can sometimes be neglected as being too dark, too inconsequential for serious study. But it is these very stories that help us understand the era in its entirety. The choices women made, the difficulties they encountered and the nefarious opportunities they greedily embraced all give us an opportunity for a richer, more nuanced understanding of this period of history. These images show us that women in the 20s weren't all just immaculately dressed while dancing the Charleston and having good times. For some, there was a much, much darker reality. This is an image from the Forensic Photography Archive. The man with the cross above his head was being investigated by the police, so even this seemingly good time was perhaps a little darker than we may think. Female criminals, from career criminals through to those who made one dumb mistake, appear throughout the collection and their stories tell us about how women of all ages fared in Sydney at this time. Here is a typical special image showing Miss V. Azelwood, whose details have mostly become lost in time. Many of the policing records about these suspects have not survived. Suspects are photographed in natural light, and here she is in the um, central police station cells area. You can see the wetness under her feet, the cells have just been mucked out. The suspects often pose beside a bent wood chair, which gives a sense of their height. You can just see it peeking out behind her as she stands. 
Their poses are quite natural, unlike mugshots with their lifeless stares. Most special photographs, like this one of Miss Azelwood, show the suspect without their hat, as they would appear indoors, and with a hat on, or in this case, with a veil which obscures her face. Perhaps not the most logical identification photograph from a modern perspective, but it did give you an idea of how she might look if you saw her walking down the street demurely veiled. The, um, the images were sometimes collated in books and written beneath each image was the category of crime with which the individual was charged. Police may have used the books for quick identification of likely suspects when investigating a crime. However, the special's informality and the lack of telltale signs that the person was in custody, such as handcuffs, meant they could be shown to a witness during the investigation of a crime without prejudicing them against the suspect. The police photographer did not interfere with the suspect's choice of pose, perhaps in order to capture a more candid and for policing purposes, more useful shot. Here we see in the bottom left corner, groups of women who haunted the rough streets of Darlinghurst during the twenties. Their photograph together indicating that they were friends or in police parlance, known associates. These images give insights into the social side of these women's lives, not just their criminal lives. This is Liverpool Street in Sydney with the infamous pub, The Tradesman's Arms, in the distance on the corner of Liverpool and Palmer Streets. This is a landscape many of the women we will meet today were intimately familiar with. A new world had emerged after the devastation of World War I and the influenza pandemic that followed hot on its heels. The 1920s saw dramatic changes in technology, entertainment, architecture and society. Young women in particular sought new freedoms. Movies began to influence the way people lived and technological developments, such as those leading to the mass manufacture of the motor car, improved the lives of millions. Change brought opportunity and criminals found ways to cash in on developing illegal markets. Police forces, their numbers reduced by war, were caught on the back foot. Their work was made harder by the fact that the laws didn't always keep up with the pace of criminal evolution. Some women also found themselves deserted by husbands who returned from the war changed men and needed to find ways to support themselves in this rapidly changing world. Some turned to crime. The 1920s was a tough time for police and an era full of opportunities for entrepreneurial types, including some women. As transport options improved, the middle classes moved away from the centre of city, leaving these, leaving suburbs of multi-level terrace housing to fall into disrepair and disrepute. Densely populated Surrey Hills became Sly Grogger, Kate Lee's heartland. Brothel Madam Matilda Tilly Devine dominated the slums of East Sydney. Both women rented and purchased these dilapidated terraces in order to run their sex and illicit alcohol businesses. They're also unique in Australian and international criminal history as being two women who dominated the criminal underworld on their own terms. Matilda Tilly Devine was a, one of a handful of women who took advantage of the opportunities provided post-war, in her case, controlling Sydney's inner city sex trade. Arriving in Sydney as a war bride in 1920, Tilly built an empire in Darlinghurst and East Sydney. She rose from being a sex worker on the streets surrounding Darlinghurst to becoming a brothel madam, running many businesses, which catered for clientele ranging from factory workers to rich businessmen. One aspect of Tilly's criminality that I personally find intriguing is her penchant for violence. She was married to James, Big Jim Devine, an ex-soldier with a well-earned reputation for violence, who was also very, very handy with a gun. 
She, however, did not rely on her husband to settle her disputes with women or even, more intriguingly, with men. This image is not a special photograph, but is one of a series of negatives belonging to the State Reformatory for Women at Long Bay, which also forms part of the New South Wales Police Forensic Photography Archive. It was taken after she was sentenced to prison for a malicious assault on a man in Darlinghurst. Tilly attacked him with a cutthroat razor, a favourite weapon of the underworld at this time. Indeed, it was so prevalent in Darlinghurst that the suburb was nicknamed Razorhurst by the media. The assault was so frenzied that the victim was left with part of the blade in his hand and with reduced mobility in that limb for the rest of his life. On another occasion, she attacked her local butcher with a knife which she held to his heart after he refused to give her a refund for some meat she'd purchased, but which she considered to be substandard. Tilly was also legendary for her use of foul language, and even the male denizens of the underworld were shocked by her fluent and inventive use of swear words, which she unleashed on all occasions, even in court. Tilly's arch nemesis was Kathleen Kate Lee, who made a fortune selling sly grog. Lee had a lengthy criminal record, which began at the age of 11, when she was charged, yes, charged, with being a neglected child wandering the streets of her hometown of Dubbo, and so was packed off to the industrial school for girls at Parramatta. She had a flair for finding new ways to make money and wasn't fussy about whether they were legal. The changes to rules governing the sale of alcohol in New South Wales provided a goldmine for her. Government attempts to restrict access to alcohol had a range of effects, some of them unexpected. For example, the prohibition of alcohol in America in 1920 had disastrous effects, turning previously law-abiding citizens into criminals corrupting police and strengthening organised crime groups. A slightly less severe effect was felt in Sydney, where pressures from temperance groups during the war led to a restriction on the sale of alcohol after 6pm. Sly Grog, alcohol sold illegally, was a major policing challenge and a very lucrative opportunity for entrepreneurial women like Kate Lee, who built an empire on crates of illicit grog. A relentlessly dangerous woman, she became the most powerful sly grogger in Sydney who shot, stabbed or slashed anyone who threatened her profits. This image of Kate is a very interesting one. She is dressed in a beautiful dress with a dodgy hem she hasn't bothered to repair. And each of her fingers is adorned with a precious ring that almost look like a knuckle duster or brass knuckles. The inscription under her name, Kay Lee, is D94, which indicates this is a drugs bureau image. It wasn't until 1928 that a dedicated drugs bureau was set up in New South Wales Police, and only two officers were initially assigned to it. The recreational use of cocaine diverted from approved medicinal uses became a major issue across the globe. It particularly appealed to young women and inner city toughs looking for a buzz. Cut with toxic chemicals such as borax, it caused numerous health problems. Many female sex workers became addicts and also sold sniffs of cocaine or snow, as it was known, on street corners to subsidise their own addictions. Sydney police were generally sympathetic to addicts but hard on dealers who were viewed as vultures preying on the vulnerable. Kate Lee always denied she sold cocaine as dealers were looked down upon, but this image, taken after a raid on one of her premises during which cocaine was found, seems to disprove this. Like Tilly, Kate was well known to Sydney police who didn't need a photograph of her to identify her. So this may have been taken to embarrass her by categorising her in police records 
as a drug dealer. One woman who suffered greatly as a result of her cocaine addiction was petty criminal Amy Lee, pictured here in 1929, aged just 43. The horrors of cocaine addiction were recognised in the media on the silver screen and literature is captured in this excerpt by Australian poet Kenneth Slesser. Lee was a cocaine addict who lived in Little Raleigh Street, Surrey Hills. When she was arrested and had this photograph taken, cocaine and morphine were found in her possession. Detective Wickham of the New South Wales Police Drug Squad spoke up for her in court and told of a previous encounter with Amy, who he had known for around 15 years. During this encounter, cocaine was found in her home alongside a bottle containing a preparation she said she'd received from a Chinese herbalist, which contained opium. She said she was going to use this opium tinged liquid to wean herself of cocaine, which had ravaged her body. During the arrest documented in this image, she allegedly had the morphine as she intended to use that to wean herself off cocaine. Detective Wickham was quite sympathetic towards her in the court. Lee's addiction was so strong she could not break away from it even when the septum of her nose collapsed, ravaged by the borax and other toxic materials used by unscrupulous dealers to bulk up the cocaine she snorted. You can see the, slat, the flatness of her nose in this image. Lee was sentenced to 12 months jail or a fine of £250, but in this case the magistrate suggested she should be admitted to the inebriate section of the prison where she could be provided with assistance to beat her addiction. Although no record for Faye Watson pictured here is found in the New South Wales Police Gazette from 1928, one of the sources we use to research the stories of these women, the Sydney Morning Herald, reports that Watson, aged 23, was arrested by Constable Thompson in a house in Crown Street, Darlinghurst and subsequently was convicted of having cocaine in her possession. She was fined 10 pounds. The press of the day denounced the act of 48 year old Albert Kurtz who was charged with having supplied this moral poison to the young Watson who was then corrupted by it. Within the archival images, we find many small time criminals whose names have been forgotten but whose stories shed a light on the darker side of the Roaring Twenties. These include some flappers whose exuberant embrace of the modern sometimes led to trouble. During the Twenties, the motion picture industry, only a couple of decades old, blossomed and began to influence behaviour and fashion. The decade's new woman, the flapper, featured prominently in magazines and films, rebelling against traditional notions of femininity. She was an alluring vision of sophistication and freedom for young women globally. Flappers danced, drank cocktails, smoked in public, drove cars, bobbed their hair, and generally defied pre-war conventions of modest feminine behavior. Their philosophy is captured in this snippet of a poem known as a flapper anthem, which captured the urgent recklessness displayed by many women of the era who knew after experiencing the horrors of war that life could be brief. And so they decided to have a good time while they could. Encountering insouciant role models in magazines and film, some women turned to crime to fund their own pursuit of this exciting but expensive lifestyle. In the case of Daisy Buchanan, and could she have any more Gatsby a name, who is pictured alongside her accomplice, Elsie Parker, a desire for silky stockings led them to commit a violent theft. Daisy Buchanan and Elsie Parker invited a door-to-door -door salesman into their home where they allegedly bashed him and robbed him of money and his stock of petticoats, bloomers, stockings and socks. They then bundled the bewildered man into a taxi and dumped him at a bus stop. 
The women were acquitted of the crime when the victim repeatedly failed to show up in court to testify against them. Perhaps there was more to this crime than just a lust for fine undergarments. Edna May Lindsay, aged 19, along with her boyfriend, was charged with forging and uttering in March 1929. Many young women like Edna began to work in offices as secretaries or in her case as a typist, a change from previous generations when she may have been a domestic servant or worked in a factory. The quality of this image is remarkable. You can see the tears shining in her eyes and taking every detail of her very fashionable clothing. Edna took a blank check from her employer and filled it into the value of 310 pounds, quite a lot of money at that time, apparently under the influence of her boyfriend, who was described in the media as a lounge hall lizard, a young man who spent too much time at the city's dance halls. The couple planned to go away, marry and make their living dancing. The cheque for such a large sum presented by such a young person aroused suspicions and police became involved. Found guilty, she was given the equivalent to a good behaviour bond. In court, the magistrate reminded Edna that there was more to life than dancing and advised her father to keep a closer watch on her. She then disappears from the criminal record. Our final shady lady is Olga Catherine Anderson, aged 29, who was convicted on the charge of blackmail for her role alongside Frank Arnold, aged 30, a musician, in the blackmail of Percival Hipgrave, a journalist from Armadale. This was a classic honey trap trick during which Olga, who claimed to be the Marchioness de Falaise, lured married men into an affair and then blackmailed them to ensure their, her silence. She worked the scam with Frank Arnold, who pretended to be her husband. He would approach the male victim and claim the affair was wrecking his wife, Olga's happiness, and then demanded money to soothe his outrage and ensure the victim's wife didn't hear of the entanglement. We can't know how many victims Olga had, but on this occasion, she was given the equivalent of a good behaviour bond while her male partner in the scam was sentenced to three years hard labour. The disparity in sentencing came down to the court's belief that Olga was the tool of her male co-conspirator, although there is nothing on record that shows she was deficient and cunning. But as a woman, it was simply believed she would have been the manipulated, not the manipulator. These fascinating images created by the police photographers show us the criminals, but not their victims. It can be easy to slip into a nostalgic, benign view of these images, but research using newspapers, police records, and the State Archives collection attempts to provide some objectivity by linking these sometimes jovial, jaunty, and desirable mugshots to crimes that affected real people, sometimes with devastating consequences. Newspaper reports tell us the stories of some of these women's victims, from beaten up rivals to pensioners who lost their life savings, and of course, police who were badly injured when arresting suspects. A hundred years after their creation, these intriguing images give us a glimpse into a Sydney lost, but not forgotten, and remind us of the dark side of the glittering, roaring 20s. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. I'm just going to open up some of the questions and endeavor to answer them for you. So Tara wants to know what year do the Long Bay photographs go up to? And are there photos for the 1930s or, nine, or just the 1920s? So in the Forensic Photography Archive at the Justice and Police Museum, we hold images from the state reformatory for women at Long Bay from 1915 up to 1930. But if you are interested in having a look at a wider range of images in a longer period, you can um, log into the State Archives website and they have a much greater um, number of criminal records than we do, including those with photographs on there. And they've got a searchable index, which is really 
fantastic. Now, Yu Yi has asked, were there conditions unique to Sydney which allowed these women to rise to the top of the inner city underworld? I don't know if it was the conditions in Sydney. I think that we just had some particularly unique women in um, Kate Lee and Tilly Devine. They were women who were ambitious, who were entrepreneurial, who had a good head for business. They used men to help them run some of their enterprises. So they had men who were running the slight grog shops, who provided protection for their um, brothels and other businesses. But they actually made their own decisions. And if somebody crossed them, they would take action themselves, as we can see from Tilly's criminal record and Kate Lee's as well. So I think they were just remarkable individuals. And to survive in Sydney's underworld during the 1920s, they had to be. Just going through the questions. Haley's asked, did the courts treat teenage girls who broke the law differently to women? They did. There was a lot of sympathy within the courts then as there is today for um, younger people who broke laws and a, um, almost a reluctance to send them to the prisons at Long Bay. So Long Bay had the state penitentiary for men and the state reformatory for women, slightly different visions of what a prison um, sentence could do for people. A lot of the teenagers would, um, if they had parents who could look after them, the parents would be spoken to in the court and you know, told to keep a closer eye on them as happened with Edna Lindsay. Or sometimes they were sent to charitable groups like you know, Salvation Army and others to those kinds of group homes where it was hoped that they get the discipline that was necessary to help them get their lives together and be able to go on to become um, more valuable citizens. In uh, New South Wales, we also had female police. So Lillian Armfield being um, one of the first appointed in 1915. And they particularly looked out for young women and tried to sort of steer them away from bad influences as part of their work as New South Wales. Wales Police Special Constables. Barbara wants to know, did the two ladies ever meet? So Kate and Tilly, they did indeed. They were renowned for the brawls that they had on the streets of Sydney. They would actually um, have fist fights. After a while, they realised, along with some of their male competitors over the sort of inner city vice and drugs and alcohol trades, that Fighting was bad for business. It drew police attention. It was a danger to the public, which meant the politicians were also focused on it. So Kate and Tilly actually staged for the newspapers one time a makeup ceremony where the two of them are shown kind of hugging each other. It kind of looks a little bit like a headlock on, on the part of Kate Lee. But they did, they did stage that kind of photograph to show that they were actually okay and that they were friends with each other. One of the factors that helped them was that Kate was really very much into the sly grog trade. Tilly was into the sex trade. It was only when it came to cocaine and their attempts to sort of carve out turf to sell cocaine that they came unstuck and began to fight with each other. Just going through some of the other questions. So Jackie's asking um, that they uh, Jackie is saying there's such evocative photographs. I'm sure there's a huge interest in the fashions of the day. Has anyone made colorized images showing the clothing the women wore? There has been quite a big um, interest in the fashions. Not only have they inspired um, some modern um, fashion designers to create pieces, um, they have also been studied by people who are interested in the history of fashion. And that's been really interesting because we can see um, 
how Australia was often, you know, a season or two seasons behind what we were seeing in America and Europe at that time. One of the things that I always find fascinating about the fashions is that women in hot, humid Sydney were wearing fur coats because that's what they saw on the silver screen, luxurious minks and furs being worn by flappers in New York where you know, the cold weather sort of justifies it. We also see women in Sydney beginning to wear these heavy fur coats, most famously Kate Lee who had a mink that she would wear in the heat of summer and she always tried to wear it to her court appearances to impress people with how rich she was. The mink was very much part of that. Um, that persona that she liked to adopt in public. And the last one is, why did the razor become so popular as a weapon during the 1920s? Cutthroat razors, so the type that men would use for shaving, cheap to buy, easy to carry, easy to conceal. And at the beginning, you know, sort of when they first started to be used extensively, um, you could actually say to a police officer, I was just going home to shave. That's not so much the women. I was going to take it home to my husband so he could shave, so that you could actually have a reasonable excuse for carrying this weapon, that it was just going to be used in you know, part of your toilet at home. Um, there were also heavy penalties towards the end of the 1920s from 1927 onwards for carrying pistols and using pistols. The police were really cracking down on those kinds of weapons. So many people relied on the razor and it's quite a terrifying um, weapon. And people who were slashed, particularly across the face, would carry the scar of that and be known, be marked as members of the underworld, which was not something that people liked, obviously. Um, it was also a weapon that would cause immense bleeding. You could bleed to death from a razor slash. And it was sometimes used against sex workers on the street to destroy their pretty faces and their livelihoods. So it was quite a terrifying, terrifying weapon that became a symbol of that 1920s in Sydney. Well, that's all I've got time for today. Next week, um, Mel Flight, our assistant curator, is going to take us through um, Elizabeth Bay House and uh, Madge Elliott's wedding there. So I hope you can join us at four o'clock next Tuesday for that talk. Thank you and have a great evening.